Hey everybody, I'm Eugene Driscoll. Welcome to Valley Naval Gazing on valleyindy.org or on 103.5 FM in New Haven or on iTunes or on SoundCloud or wherever you might be hearing us. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at Valley Indy. You want to look us up on Facebook, it's facebook.com slash Valley Independent Sentinel because we decided to go with the longest name humanly possible. All nine syllables. That's Ethan Fry, uh, my co-host. We haven't had a Valley Naval Gazing in a while. How are you this morning, Ethan? Good, good, very good. So we're recording this on uh, whatever day it is. It's Friday, September 9th, but for broadcast on Monday. And we're going to be venturing out of our wheelhouse a little bit today mm. to talk about state politics. And that's because our guest is Joseph Yauman, who is running for state representative uh, on the Republican line, challenging a longtime incumbent, Linda Gentile. So, first of all, thank you for uh, appearing on our podcast this morning. Thank you guys for having me. It's great to be here. And like I said, we don't normally cover uh, state politics just because we have enough to do on the local level, and there's only two of us. So I'm a little afraid about being Matt Lauer as we record this. <laughs> oh. We're right on the heels of the Matt Lauer Zing. thing. Well, it's not a zing. I'm, I'm saying I am. I'm, I'm, mm. I'm not as... I mean, we don't deal with state politics every day. So I just say that. So if you don't like my questions, I apologize uh, in advance. But on the other hand, there's really... You know, as media has consolidated and shrank on the local level the last couple of years, you know, if you're in the industry, you're well aware of how state reporting has uh, pulled back you know, there's sort of the big players in the state or the CT Mirror, CT News Junkie cover state politics. The Post has uh, reporters assigned to it, but none of the dailies have as much as they did, say, 20, 30 years ago. Mm. So it's hard for a candidate, or I assume it's hard for a candidate, particularly a challenger, to get the word out. So your campaign actually reached out to us and said, hey, can, can we do a podcast? And we said, yeah, that, that's a great idea, even though we not, you know, our questions might not be uh, a Charlie Rose uh, level. We're honored to have you on because it's important to inform the public. That's our mission. Well, you're, you're a uh, daily read for me, and I'm a big fan. Uh, I've been reading you guys for years, so, uh, and I've been listening to the podcast for years, so it's an honor to be here. Yeah, and apparently we almost have a shared history where we're practically neighbors. You said you're from, uh, where are you from originally? I'm from Mayapak, New York. Right, and I'm from uh, Lake Lincolndale, a, a part of Somers, and uh, those two communities practically touch each other. They I do. spent a lot of time cutting through the woods uh, to go up to a tea kettle area where, where you're from. So let's, why don't we go in a little bit about uh, like who you are, get to know you a little bit, because I think that's important for voters uh, before we get to some, some issues. Uh, you, you, had, you had told me like just before we turned the mics on, what was it like going to high school? What was your daily routine to get to high school growing up in uh, Mayapak, New York? It was a 45 to one hour commute, 45 minutes to one hour commute down to White Plains. I went to uh, Archbishop Stepanak High School in White Plains. That commute from Mayapak, thankfully my father worked in White Plains at the time and was able to take me down most mornings, but my commute was back on the train, Metro North. So, I mean, what time are you getting up in the morning? To I mean, I'm familiar with, uh, th that's unusual in that uh, not a lot of uh, kids from like Somers and Mayapak, New York, if they go to Catholic school, they don't go quite that far because they were, they were more local. What time did you have to get up in the morning to, to catch the train? Between 6 and 6.30. It was, an, it, was an, it was an early morning. Generally, I had to commute with my father if I had to take the train. It was a little bit earlier. But, uh, yeah, it, it, it was a challenge to get down there. But uh, there was two of us, so I did have a, a, a compatriot in arms, I, should, I guess you could put it. Another student? Another what? student that, was tra that traveled with me um, most mornings going down and most mornings going back for the did full that, four years. And maybe I'm making more of this than I should, but how did that like, inform your learning? Or I mean, that's a, I think I, if I was 14 years old, I just would have jumped off the train and ran into the woods and probably <laughs> never graduated high school, seriously. Uh, what did you get out of it? It was a great experience, actually. Um, I, had, I made a lot of friends down there, friends from all over. Um, most, of the, most of the students that went there were from the White Plains area, Yonkers, even the Bronx, uh, as far north as Mayapak and Somers and uh, a few other students from all over. So I got to make friends from all over. I keep in touch with a lot of them, uh, Facebook and other places. So. And then take us through... Uh, how you wound up here in Ansonia. You're an Ansonia resident. I am. We should. Okay. How yeah. did you wind up here? Well, I went to, uh, I ended up, I went to college at uh, Albany, State University in New York in Albany. And my desire was always to go to law school. It's one of those things that I always wanted to do. So, and Why is that? Like, it, it was just one of those things growing up. Um, 
What did your dad do for a living? My father was a director of data telecommunications, and he worked for Seagram's down in White Plains for many, many years before that, CBS, and then uh, had a job for Eli Lilly out in Indianapolis. After I graduated from high school, they, my family moved out there for a period of about 15, 16 years. But uh, yeah, after, I mean, after college, uh, I came back. I lived in Mayapak for a year. I worked uh, in medical billing, actually, uh, a place called the Katona Medical Group. Oh, sure, yeah. 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 <laughs> Just totally inside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I, yeah. I did that for about a year um, and applied for law schools, uh, figuring out where I wanted to go. And I got into Quinnipiac, and it was the right fit. I had always loved Connecticut, even growing up as a kid. And I went, in 2000, I moved here. And so uh, why law? You're, you're an attorney. Yep. Uh, you have I your am. own practice. I do. In, uh, in Bridgeport. In Bridgeport. It's myself, it, a partner, and then we have uh, six employees. And your what type of law is it? Uh, we're a litigation it? firm mostly. Uh, we do pretty much soup to nuts litigation. Uh, we do some transactional work, um, business consultations, real estate transactions. But for the most part, we're courtroom lawyers, uh, criminal, civil, juvenile. So. And then uh, as I keep interrupting myself, why law? What was it about law that attracted you to it? It was just something my, my parents were both very political, I guess you could say, in the sense that it was something that was always talked about in our house. Um, always very informed about what was going on, local, state, and even national. And uh, it was just one of those things that grabbed me at a young age. And I were your never parents involved like in the, in, in, in the town politically and things Not like really. that? Not um, oh, really. So they were talking more about sort yeah, of national, it, uh, just the, the issues yeah, of the day? It was, it was also the local. It was always a dis- topic of discussion around the dinner table, what was going on in the community. Um, very informed. I mean, they went to meetings. They never ran for anything. Um, I think I'm the first person in my family to ever run for any office, actually. But um, they were always very active in talking about things that were going on. And uh, it was always something I felt very strongly about as a kid and growing up. And, and then uh, your age. You, you got, I got a couple of years on you. You graduated high school 95, you 95. said. How old are you? 39. And are you married? I'm engaged. Engaged. Yep. Okay. My fiance's name's Crystal. Crystal. Okay. And then so you graduated Quinnipiac. You got your law degree there. Am I pronouncing it right? I've been told yeah, I pronounce... You, well, that's one of the tricky parts about um, my campaign is right, first yeah. getting people to say my name the right way. It's actually pronounced Yaoman. Yaoman, Yaoman. But spelled which, with the J. Which how I else said, would it... Quinip, Quinnipiac? How else would you... Of the college? I, I don't even want to get into it because I'll, I'll just do a... I'll just do a mind. There's, there's some other way that I... QU is the easy way to... QU, okay. yeah, yeah. Go, I think there's a New York way to pronounce it. Go I think Bobcats. Connecticut, yeah. Connecticut people pronounce it incorrectly. But so, and then how did you wind up specifically in Ansonia? Uh, it was just a place uh, when I came here for law school. Um, I ventured out a lot, drove around, um, like I said, growing up. Connecticut was the sort of the envy of many New Yorkers growing up. I don't know if you felt the same way. It was the, you, wanted, <laughs> you, you liked Connecticut. It was where you wanted to go. It was, you know, it was the place we traveled a lot to the Danbury Mall. And the Danbury Mall, I was going to say. Danbury that, that, Fair. That was the extent of my involvement in Connecticut, the Danbury Mall. Yeah. Well, I, I was always, you know, as a kid going to Connecticut, I had an aunt and uncle and cousins that lived in Connecticut, so I, I was here a lot. Uh, Is your fiancé from here? She's not. She's actually from Florida. Okay. Yeah, I met her in actually D.C. I, after law school, I did a year down at American University. I got a master's of law and law and government, and that's where we met. And the rest is history. Yeah, and I, I'm asking you sort of all this background stuff because one of the things that, uh, you know, we've been covering the Valley for about seven years now, and uh, there's, you know, to, to get elected oftentimes, the stereotype in the Valley on any level, uh, any elected level, I mean, you have to be from here. Your grandmother had to be born here. You have to prove that, you know, when Ansonia was incorporated, one of your relatives was there <laughs> signing a document. You had to play football at one point. Mm-hmm. You had to be, not only did you have to play football, you had to be a member of a championship team mm. a, at some point. Uh, and th- these are all, like play I said, quarterback. St- you had to be, yeah, right? You had to be a specific position on a team. So it's hard for someone who is relatively uh, new in the community. Sorry, that's my wife telling me that drop-off went well for mm-hmm. my preschooler and, and first grader. It's hard for somebody to, to sort of break in, I imagine. Uh, why are you running? It's, it's challenging, um, the name recognition part, um, making sure that, first of all, people pronounce my name correctly, but uh, other than that, making sure that people know that there's someone else out there. I mean, you'd mentioned that I, I received the Republican nomination and most recently the endorsement. I was also, I received the endorsement from the Independent Party as well uh, in recent weeks. But one of the reasons, I mean, the reason I'm running is I'm just very concerned about the direction our state is headed. That's really what it comes down to. It comes down to uh, the difficulties in the budget, 
difficulties in the economy and the tax increases. Uh, you know, the two largest tax increases in state history over the last six years, uh, it, it's, it's troubling. We're chasing businesses out of here. I've been knocking on doors for the better part of two, two and a half months, and a lot of people tell me, but for my mother being here, but for my children not being old enough to leave yet. Uh, a lot of people want to leave. A lot of people are going down to the Carolinas, to Tennessee, to Florida, and that has a lot to do with the fact that the economy is staggering here, and businesses are leaving, and there's just not enough jobs. How's it affected uh, your business? Has the state economy hurt the law firm? Anyway? Sure. Uh, of course it has. I mean, the economy, I mean, when people don't have money, um, one of the things, the first things, from our, our perspective anyway, uh, is that they cut is they don't want to pay a lawyer or they want to pay a lawyer less. Um, so it ter in terms of fees that are coming in and revenue that's being generated, we have to, in order to keep the same client base or keep the same clients, we have to be willing to take a little bit less um, and work with people in terms of payment plans. Um, everybody has less money in their pocket. And it, I think it hurts businesses across the board. And then, uh, like, just getting back to this challenge of name rec recognition, I was looking at uh, some of the candidates that the Republicans had run in past races. Uh, then again, we, you know, we don't cover state politics, but I never, I don't think there was much of a campaign ever. It, it seemed like if mm. somebody had a pulse, you could run against uh, uh, Linda. Sort of like, yeah, throw their name on the ballot just to put somebody out there, yeah. Yeah, so what are the Republicans, obviously that strategy did not work, so what the Republicans <coughs> were doing in past campaigns, they can't do that again or they're just gonna lose mm. again, logic being logic. Uh, what's being done different this time? How are you, uh, going to try to basically topple an entrenched incumbent? Well, I think it's, I don't think it's about party politics. And I, and, I, and I guess that's one of the things that I start with. It's not about being a Republican or a Democrat or an independent. It's about the ideas. And my, my thoughts are we're going in the wrong direction. And what are the ideas to fix that? And we need to get back to a balanced budget and predictability. Businesses want to see a government that is working towards a predictable solution. And you have to know what that solution is going forward. That's what businesses want. Large companies want to see that in order to maintain their presence here in Connecticut and create jobs here. And if they don't trust the leadership of the state to make the right decisions and be pro-business, they're going to be the ones that are exiting. And it's one of the complaints that GE had before they left. And so if, if I asked you, you know, what's the, the top issue uh, in the state right now, You've hinted at your answer, but what would that? What would your answer be? Well, I think it's threefold. Like I said, I think it's the economy, I think it's the taxes, and I think it's the budget. And I think they all three of those things, while separate issues, roll into the same sort of topic or issue rather to that comes down to is we are going in the wrong direction, and what are we doing to try to fix it? What are the common sense ideas that we can bring to the table? And I think you need new blood and fresh people and uh, new ideas to try to do that. And then continuing with talking about the economy, and feel free to jump in with mm. any uh, follow-up questions so I don't get embarrassed like Matt Lauer, Ethan, okay? <laughs> uh, and I'm reading, this is from a recent story in the CT Mirror, which is a nonprofit um, news site covering state politics with a bunch of ex-current guys and women up there. Regarding the Connecticut economy, this is a quote. Uh, XJI, X too. Further Sorry. complicating, further complicating manner, state controller... Kevin Lembo warned officials not to count on a roaring state economy to fix everything. Connecticut continues to recover jobs lost in the Great Recession, but still lags behind the national average. And then a quote from Lembo, we remain on a relatively slow path to recovery. The state is adding back jobs, but has yet to achieve the type of wage growth required to jumpstart the economy. So what specific steps would you recommend be taken in order to grow jobs in Connecticut? Because we still haven't recovered from uh, 2008. Well, I think the efforts need to be focused on where the, where, you have to stabilize revenue because until you get that balanced budget on track, uh, we have a projected bu budget deficit of over $2 billion over in the next biennium. And that is concerning. And now we have the new, the new added, I guess, uh, issue of now having to fix the education system based on the court's ruling from a couple of days ago. Major, so, that, and, that, and that's major for cities like Ansonia and Derby. Absolutely, and it's an opportunity. And I agree 100% um, with the people that are coming out and saying this is an opportunity to fairly fund the education systems here in Ansonia, here in Derby. We have been underfunded for too many years uh, under the old system. We're getting funded at, in, the, in the 70s and in the 60 percentile um, in both cities, and it's, it's just unfair that 
that's the funding levels that are going to co to communities that are labeled economically distressed, while other communities such as Fairfield and whatnot are receiving 100 percent plus, 150 percent, 200 percent. Now, I saw on our Facebook page, we posted some articles about that recent uh, judge's ruling on education funding in the state, who called it, the judge called it irrational and unconstitutional, mm -hmm. I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's ba they're, they're, they're basically talking about a, a big grant that the state gives to local school districts every year. In communities like Ansonia, I think it's like 16 million and change. It's well more than half of the school budget. Um, but Ansonia has said for years that they're still being... Uh, underfunded under the formula that the legislature is supposed to uh, use to award that money. Um, you know, people, the, the judge uh, ordered uh, the state to, you know, essentially fix it in six months. And I think like 180 no, days, which is no, a school no, year. <laughs> nobody thinks that will happen. Like think people think that like the state will appeal it to, you know, stall it. But we'll see, you know, we'll see what, what my, they come up with. My question, like it started a, a discussion in our, mm. our Facebook page yeah, among, yeah. among residents. I don't know if they're specifically from Ansonia, <coughs> but I found this one person just asked somebody who said, well, why don't you just if Ansonia, if you live in Ansonia and you don't like your school district or you have uh, issues with what move somewhere else, go to Woodbridge. How do you answer something like that? Like, why if why don't you just, uh, as an attorney, move out of Ansonia and go to where a better school district is? Well, I don't. I don't think that's the answer to. The, I don't think that's the right answer. I think the answer, or the, I think the question that should be asked is, why aren't we fairly funding the schools here? It shouldn't be. Uh, an, it shouldn't have to come down to a resident having to move away to get that fair funding in the school and to be, to get the same level of education that you get in West Hartford or Fairfield. It, it's a matter of going through this formula, the CCS formula, and fairly funding it. And why are some school districts getting 200%, but yet Ansonia and Derby receive in the 60s and the 70s? And, and just continuing along uh, that line, this is another question born from CT Mirror reporting. It was from an article by Tom Condon, who was a former Hartford Great current. columnist, yeah. Yeah, muckety-muck, he was one of the big My wigs. My grandmother knew him. There you go. Who, uh, he specializes basically in land use and, and how it affects uh, tax policy. So it's gonna take me a second to even frame this question. Uh, and maybe it's not even a question. Maybe it's just a launching pad uh, for a discussion. But the, the headline was articled, Will Hartford's Crisis Force a CT Property Tax Overhaul? The article was headlined. You, you spoonerized that, but I just wanted to note, note that. Go ahead. A 2015 study by the New England Public Policy Center of the Boston Fed found that 78 of the state's 169 cities and towns do not have the capacity to raise enough revenue to cover their non-education expenses. Then there was a map where they showed you know, who can't afford to uh, fund non-education expenses. And Derby and Ansonia, the two towns, if elected, you'd be representing them, were colored in deep red uh, in that map, meaning both cities rely heavily on state and federal aid to keep afloat. Uh, and then the article continued, you know, Hartford has far and away the highest tax rate, 74.29 mills of any in the state. Waterbury and Bridgeport are next in line with mill rates of 58 and 54. The people in the poorest cities pay the highest taxes. Kevin Maloney, Maloney Connecticut Council of Municipalities, said Hartford and other distressed cities have inordinately, how do you say that word? Inordinately? Inordinately. In, in, inordinately. inordinately. There you go. High property taxes but lower ho housing values and high demand for critical municipal services. But they can't tax at a high enough level to pay for those services. Over-reliance on the property tax coupled with inadequate state aid, particularly education aid, placed Connecticut towns and cities in a severe fiscal bind. And then I'm just going to just indulge me for one more second, because I think you can insert, and you correct me if I'm wrong, Ansonia or Derby into this mm. story. They have a quote from someone who spoke up at a Bridgeport uh, municipal meeting recently. Uh, and this person says, why would a business of any size want to locate in Bridgeport when the surrounding towns have tax rates that are so much less, essentially? The surrounding towns also have better schools and better support services. And he says the answer is simple. They won't unless we change course. Uh, and that was said at a July 5th city council meeting. So uh, isn't, that, isn't that basically the problem that's facing uh, Derby and Ansonia? We rely almost exclusively on, on property taxes to uh, fund our city? Well, I don't necessarily think that's exclusively the problem. I think the problem comes down to is that the revenue that the state is generating based on, 
I mean, we've just seen the two largest tax increases in state history. Where is that money going? That revenue needs to be spent fairly and be redistributed fairly to the school districts. And that's where, that's where we're running astray. Uh, and I think that's what the decision that came out two days ago says, is that, yes, there, the property taxes are too high in certain communities, certainly. And that, has to, and that has to do with raising the revenue to meet what the funding cuts have been in certain areas from the state. And why isn't the state fairly funding those communities? And I think that's what the decision spells out. Would you be in favor of the, you know, one thing that we hear about all the time in Derby and Ansonia, special education costs, mm. the cities can just, they just can't, literally can't afford to fund these services. Do you think the state should uh, pick up that tab? Is that something that should go back to the state? And, and how, would you, how would just be something you would lobby for if you were elected? Well, as it is right now, I, it's my understanding that there is a special line item for special education funding. And that funding that's coming through, I think, and that decision even speaks to that as well, is just not being fairly distributed either. It's the poorest communities, it's the economically distressed communities that have uh, biggest and most difficult issues with special education, and they're the ones that are receiving less funding than other school districts to address those needs. Okay, and then locally, here in Ansonia, you're the chairman of the Planning and Zoning Commission. Planning and Zone. Okay. So uh, economic development is fascinating to me, particularly on this local level in Ansonia and Derby. Uh, we always hear, we kind of get the answer all the time, oh, every, there's lots of businesses interested, there's lots of corporations interested, uh, but then it never seems to happen, although Ansonia has been making progress, uh, as has Derby. And I'm just wondering, since you're on the, and in the Economic Development Commission as I well, am. so if a project, if it, you know when a business comes and is at least sort of uh, uh, poking Ansonia, there, maybe there's an interest, maybe they don't come forward with an application and it doesn't become public, but, mm -hmm. but you know when they're sort of behind the scenes taking a look at, at the city. What's the biggest roadblock to uh, Ansonia and Derby, do you think? What, why do businesses go elsewhere? Well, I think it's the revitalization of some of the old properties, um, some of the and the remediation, and some of the economic and the environmental issues that are raised on certain properties. Right over here uh, at the end of Main Street, um, the old copper and brass, and, and getting some of that remediation done, and using the property tax rebates to the company to help get some of that stuff done. But there was a bill recently in, in, the, past in the past session of the legislature which spelled out a partnership between the state, the municipality, and a private land bank to allow those community to allow those properties to come into that land bank and receive certain tax rebates over a period of time. It was ended, ultimately it passed the legislature and was vetoed by the governor, but because there was too many, as I understand it, stand it from some of the editorials, is that there was too many tax rebates going back to the private corporation. Now, I think that is a way to deal with some of those properties. I fully support that and the idea of getting a partnership together to revitalize some of these old properties that can really be turned into um, a booming economy booming economic development for whatever would be able to fit into those particular spaces in the next few years. And so what happens is a developer will come forward and maybe look at one of the old factories here and basically say it's just it has too many issues it's too expensive for me to to invest uh, in it. And that's it and they need they those developers need the incentives and f you know over the last decade those incentives have been only coming from municipalities. And once you get the state involved and the state giving the ability to give other tax rebates to those municipalities or to the land bank or to the private developer, that's when you can really start making that progress. I mean, the, right after uh, Cassetti took office in 2013, there was, uh, the state did announce, uh, I think there was like a half a million dollar grant for downtown uh, to like, you know, try to deal with some of these problem properties you talked about. Is that just, I mean, it's, is that just not enough? I mean, is that like a cup of water in the ocean? I, um, I think it is. I think those grants, the grants are a good start. But once you get past the grants, what are we doing long term? Because we don't need just a one-time grant coming back to fix one particular parcel of property. We need greater help and the ability to have this land bank include more and more of these properties and remediate and then get them back out there and then sales back to private corporations and developers that are going to actually make something out of these properties once they're remediated. How about in terms of uh, regionalization is something that we hear mm -hmm. a lot at the Valley Indy uh, talked about, although it never really seems, at least in our lifetime as a young publication, hasn't happened to any extent in the Naugatuck Valley. Uh, what are your thoughts on regionalization and if you could waive 
a magic wand. Are there any local services in the Naugatuck Valley that you think should be combined or not? Well, specifically, I, I don't. Th- I can't think of any specific services, but I think it's certainly something worth exploring. I think uh, regionalization, when um, each specific community is spending X number of dollars to do one thing, if you can combine and in some way, shape, or form, find cost savings um, to combine those services over a year or a long-term contract or some, some long-term plan. I would be in favor of that. Um, that stuff has to be done at the local level, however. The Board of Aldermen um, and Derby and Mansonia would have to get together. The Board of Selectmen and Seymour would have to make those decisions amongst themselves and speak uh, directly before that stuff can be done. How about regionalizing schools? That's something that's always talked about. Do you think that could benefit the Naugatuck Valley if uh, either the Derby School District combined with another one or Ansonia somehow to uh, I think potentially. Costs? I think it's something that should be explored. Um, I don't think you want to take stuff like that off the table. Um, like I said earlier, I'm, I'm very much in favor of ideas, whatever side of the aisle they come from and wherever they come from. Ideas that can help our communities is really what I'm about. And if regionalization of schools is something um, that people think can co- you know, work out in the future, then I think it's something we should explore. Without more detail and more information, it's hard to s- say that is a good idea or a bad idea, but I think it's something we should study and certainly explore. I saw yesterday one of the, a press release from CCM, the Connecticut Conference of Municipalities. One of the things they pointed out from that education funding lawsuit was that it should be easier to consolidate. Apparently, if you try to consolidate, there's so many mm. hoops to jump through. It's a 15-year process, uh, which sort of, you know, districts don't want to go through that mm-hmm. and municipalities and so i think it's done in the same way as my understanding is that the board of aldermen and, and the two municipalities or three municipalities that would want to do such a thing would actually have to appoint a group <laughs> to study it that study would have to come back to them before they make the decision i don't know the time frame but that was my understanding of how the process yeah there were, around 2012 there was one meeting uh, sort of high level meeting at derby city hall between ansonia and derby school officials but it Beyond that one meeting, I don't, I'm not, I don't, I don't know that anything happened beyond and, that. And yeah, there a wasn't. new, a new uh, committee just launched. I, okay. I think it's the third that's launched since we've uh, been around to examine whether they can share some services, like WPCA. There's yeah, even the, like the there's even talk WPCA possibly has always been a, a police topic of, is another one that's come up a little bit, but I don't know if those will. And and like yeah, like that's something you see like when when something happens, uh, you know, like a, a you know a, a crime of note occurs in either town. Uh, you get cops, you know, going over to to help out uh, in most cases. So, how about tolls on highways? That's a one. That's sort of a hot hot button issue in in Connecticut, or at least seems to be. Uh, what are your thoughts on putting some tolls on our highways that could be used to uh, the revenue could be used to upgrade our failing transportation system or infrastructure? You have to be careful with tolls. Because it's my understanding that we already receive about $500 million from the federal government. So the placement of the tolls is important because you can't place the tolls just at the borders. Um, to try to receive that extra revenue from people from Rhode Island, Massachusetts, or New York coming into the state. So the placement of the tolls is important. Um, tolls, I'm not necessarily in favor of tolls. I, I think it causes issues along the way. But if tolls were to be used, I think the most important part about that is a lockbox. You got to take that money and set it aside for transportation. And that's been an issue that's been ongoing in the legislature over the last few sessions is whether or not this money is going to go into the general fund or it's going to go into lockbox. If you're going to set money aside and you're going to collect money for a specific purpose, I think that money should be dedicated to that purpose and that purpose only. Okay. Do you have a follow up on no, tolls there? No, go I know ahead. that was I asked that for you. I know that's no. your favorite. I, well, I, I have, I have, like, I'm, I'm pro toll personally, but I, I, well, well, we disagree. Well, he's not ruling it out. You, you're not. I'm not ruling it out. I just think that if you're going to go the direction of tolls, um, I wouldn't say absolutely not right now. But if we're going to go that direction, I think that money needs to be specifically set aside for transportation and transportation only. I don't want to see it slipping into the general fund that can be used for other things. Let's let's play the political label game because it's so uh, it's interesting. Just to me as a reporter, I've been doing this for like 15 years now, and the uh, you know it used to be like Republican and. <coughs> Democrat. Right? It, it's a way to sort of gauge where you fall on this political spectrum, because now it really is a whole rainbow spectrum. How would you, there's so many different labels we hear, how would you describe your own political philosophy? We hear like alt-right, Reagan Republican, fiscally conservative, uh, moderate Republican. Where do you fall? What's, what's that? What's what? Uh, moderate Republican. Uh, Mayor Bouton of Danbury. Oh, right, okay. 
That's what he calls himself. Okay. Right? And you don't have to. Independent. Yeah. An independent. That, okay. that would be my. I was. I registered as a Republican in January of this year. I've been an independent most of my life. Oh, that's um, interesting. Okay. I think that, like I said earlier, ideas come from both sides. It's not really about uh, a political party or a position. It's about where the ideas come from and what are the solutions that are going to best help our communities. What motivated you to switch your party affiliation or to actually to enroll in a party? I mean, seeing what's happening in Hartford, um, I think the common sense solutions. The Republicans have put forth a plan. It's called the Pathway to uh, Sustainability. They have a long-term plan. It's a five-year plan to get us back in, in budget, to get our budget balanced, um, to not cut essential services, to not raise taxes, to try to keep as many employees employed with the state as possible, um, but making cuts and, and reductions in other areas and yeah, trying wh- to do Where do you cut like the that. fat? I'm sorry, I, I just interrupted you. That was rude. Uh, it's okay. Um, where do you cut the fat in state government? Like, you know, where is, I, mean, I guess I just read an article that Malloy had been, you know, talking, he, layoffs had started as a way to try to get us out of this uh, economic, however you want to describe it, mm-hmm. we're in. Uh, but he hadn't quite, the layoffs haven't reached the rate that he had indicated. Uh, so like, where's the fat where do you where do you cut in state government it's hard to say without taking you know a full and fair and honest look at the entire budget which i can tell you i have not done um the budget is is a very large document uh, i've looked at a lot of the um, the bullet points and i've looked at a lot of the um, the line items but specific to agencies it's a, i have not done that but i think you i think you go line i think you assess programs as if they're working and that's one of the things in this pathway to sustainability that the, uh, that the Republicans have been touting in the General Assembly that they talk about is that a two-year look at every single program to see if a program is working. And if it's not working, get rid of the program or start another program. And I think you can trim the fat. If things are working and they're going in the right direction, then you continue to use those programs. But if they're not working, if they're failed, at that point in time, it's time to cut the waste. And you had said you had, you had gone from independent to Republican. And just, uh, I guess yesterday, we just received a press release from Derby Republicans saying they endorsed you and the Ansonia Town Republican Party endorsed you. Uh, I'm wondering, what is, that, what is that process like? Are you, what questions do they ask you uh, to, in order to get that uh, endorsement? And I'm wondering if there's any hesitation, since you're a new Republican, to, you know, was there any hesitation to anoint you? Was there a litmus test question? There was a series of questions. Um, I, I think it, it's getting to know somebody over a period of time. It wasn't the first um, town committee meeting I had been to in Derby. Um, and Ansonia, I am a town committee member now. Um, so it's getting to know a person over a period of time. I think each person on the town committee gets to ask you questions, um, sometimes in passing, sometimes um, when you're actually at a meeting. And it's it, that's kind of where the endorsement comes from, getting to know the person a little bit, feeling comfortable with them, knowing where their ideas are, knowing where their positions are, and then making the endorsement. And I ask because I'm wondering, I know one thing in the Naugatuck Valley, lower Naugatuck Valley, that we see a lot of just through our interactions with people every day on social media or in the streets or at meetings, uh, gun control, the Second Amendment uh, is important to people mm. here in the, in the lower valley. I, at least from my perspective, I could be wrong. Or maybe I'm only hearing from a, a loud few. I, I don't know. Mm. But what's your position on those post-Sandy Hook gun control measures that the state enacted? I am pro-Second Amendment. Um, I, in terms of regulations dealing with it, I don't think the proper way is to ban lawful gun ownership or restrict lawful gun ownership. I think these are mental health issues, and I think they need to be dealt with as mental health issues. Um, Adam Lanza didn't do that tragedy because he was a, he was a gun owner he did that tragedy because he had mental health problems and that's that those are the real issues that we have to address is making sure that um people that are going to be able to get their hands on weapons um are dealing with their mental health issues do you think those laws should be repealed uh, some of them were you know and this is from the ct mirror they had quoted uh the measures uh, in post Sandy Hook were expanding the weapons covered by the 1993 assault weapons ban, adding the Bush Mas- Master XM-15, a variant of the AR-15, uh, and dozens of other weapons by name. It also limited ammo magazines to no more 
than 10 rounds. Do you think that's something that should be uh, pulled back? I, I think restrictions on lawful gun ownership um, is contrary to what the Second Amendment is. So that's those specific the, the, the specific uh, laws that were put in place in Connecticut after Sandy Hook. You would be in favor of taking those specific laws back? I would. Okay. What about then? That was passed by by a bipartisan panel. I mean, would, no one voted against it, as far as I know. It was uh, it had bipartisan partisan mm-hmm. support. Uh, why do you think Republicans uh, voted for that? And what's your assessment uh, of that vote? Well, I think it, that vote came very close um, to the actual tragedy itself. Um, I think people. I, I think legislation is not supposed to be knee jerk and reactionary. And I think that there, there needs to be a rational basis to that. And maybe that's the legal training. Maybe that's the lawyer in me talking. I don't know. Um, but I think a lot of those measures were passed in a rushed fashion and considered. I don't know if the, what the rational basis is to restrict the number of bullets that go into a magazine. Um, there's been no study that I'm aware of that shows that it cuts down on um, a tragedy from occurring or when a tragedy is occurring, it stops the amount of um, issues that occur or deaths that occur during that tragedy. So it's, it's, I guess that's my concern is the knee jerk reaction to tragedies that happen. Legislation is supposed to come out and it's supposed to be balanced. It's supposed to be reasoned and it's supposed to be logical. And I'm not necessarily any of sure that legislation itself um, lends itself to any of those things. And, and just I, to note, the, it was yeah, 26 me. to 10 in the Senate and 105 to 44 in the House. Um, it was, there was a deal between Democrats and Republicans, but some Republicans still voted no. Up. Yeah, as that came out of my mouth, I knew it was wrong, but that's, uh, that's live podcasting. Mm-hmm. How about, uh, you know, I was looking at the, the Washington Post. They did a story in June 2015, and they were reporting that a 1994 gun control measure in Connecticut may, and they sort of tied this together, but wasn't definitive, may have helped to usher in a 40% decrease in gun killings between 96 and 2005. And that law was referred to as a permit to purchase <coughs> process in Connecticut. Uh, and it came after a spat of highly uh, publicized gang shootings, I think in Bridgeport uh, at the time. Uh, do you think, I mean, uh, the, the, the gun control legislation that was in place prior to Sandy Hook uh, do you think that was enough, or should we go back and uh, take away laws that came prior to that? In terms of specific- like permitting, like the, the process it, it, you have to go through now to uh, to get a, a a handgun, say. Yeah, I'm in favor of permitting. I think permitting is a uh, is a is a good way to judge. I think you have the the ability at that point in time to judge the character of the person, and I think that's important. And it also gives you a gauge of a, whether or not a person has those mental health issues that I was alluding to earlier. Do you ever hear that on the campaign trail when you're out knocking on doors? Does, Some does gun control come out? It does. Okay. How, does it like what, what do you hear the most of when you're when you're knocking um, on doors? It's a, it, generally the people that are asking the questions about um, gun issues are um, pro two A. They're pro-Second Amendment, and they want to make sure that the person that they're speaking to um, has their same views on the Second Amendment. And is it, uh, I mean, if you go to, if you knocked on uh, 10 doors, do you hear it out of, I'm just curious, uh, do you hear it from nine doors, or is it uh, few and far between? Is it? No, the, mo- the, the biggest issue um, that I hear about is the budget, the economy, and taxes. Again, um, people are upset about the the cost of living here, it, it, the tax increases, the two largest tax increases in state history raise taxes pretty much across the board. And people are upset about it. Uh, I, I hear it a lot. If I knock on 10 doors, um, I'm guessing seven or eight of the people, those are the biggest issues to them. And now in, in, against this uh, backdrop, we have a presidential, the U.S. presidential race is happening, which is, uh, I'm, it's the most insane race that I've seen in my lifetime. Not yeah. that I'm a presidential scholar. But I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna editorialize. I, there I think and say it beats. That. I think it beats Eisenhower Stevenson. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Uh, like. And I'm wondering on the local level because we've seen it. This is the first time in sort of my uh, local journalism career where things are permeating on the on the local level. You're hearing uh, the country's so divided, it is. It pops up locally. Mm. Uh, I'm wondering if you think that. Like Donald Trump being the standard bearer for the uh, the, uh, the Republican Party, does that help or uh, hinder your efforts to try to unseat an incumbent on the state level? 
I think I don't necessarily know it does either. Um, I think people ask about Donald Trump when I'm knocking on doors, but it's not the main issue. I think people are differentiating between the national elections and the state elections. Um, I think you have two unpopular candidates. Hil uh, I don't think Hillary nor Donald Trump is um, receiving the love from anybody. Um, they're two of the most unpopular candidates that we have seen. And people understand that. People are more concerned about what is hitting their wallet, what is hitting their pocketbook. Um, those are most of, the, most of the questions that I'm fending and dealing with when I'm out there. People want to know how you're going to change things. People want to know what direction you're going to do and, and what things you can do as a state legislator. And it's a lot about educating people and making sure that they're aware that you know they understand the difference between municipal elections, state elections, and, and national elections. Will you vote for Donald Trump, you think? Uh, I have not sold yet. Um, I, I, I can't say. I know I will not vote for Hillary. Um, Donald Trump, I have some reservations, a lot of them actually at this point. Um, I'm waiting, looking forward to the presidential debates. I haven't been paying much attention to national politics. I've been more involved in my race yeah. here and a lot of stuff on the state level. But I'll probably make that decision after the presidential election or the presidential debates rather. Did you have a question? Oh, I could feel you. That was gonna, the, my question was going to be, are you going to vote for him? So. Okay. Uh, and then so what happens now? So it's, what is it, September already? It is. So this election's right around the corner. What do you 59 do? 59 days from now, I think. Wow. So what do you do between now and election day uh, to try to get people to, to know you and to, and to win people over? Well, I, I issued a debate challenge. I'm hoping that Linda will agree. Um, I think an open and fair discussion of the issues. Uh, one of the first, in my first press release, actually, um, one of the things that Linda had said in a comment is that I hope it's going to be that we can, she's going to run on her record and that this is going to be a clean campaign. And that's, that's my intent. I don't, there's going to be no personal attacks. This isn't one of those campaigns. It's about the issues. Um, we have two different views. Um, I don't know Linda that well. I've met her uh, on a few different occasions, but she's very well known. She's very well liked um, from everything I understand. She's a wonderful person. Um, it's not about that. It's about the vision that we both have and the differences in those visions. Okay. I mean, those are all the questions I had. I don't know, Ethan, if you had any more questions for our guest. No. Is there anything else you wanted to add, perhaps, that we're, we completely missed that you want to uh, bring up? Now's the time. Well, I just think that this election cycle is important uh, for the future of our state. I think it's one of the most important elections uh, that we have going forward. Uh, we are looking at a very difficult budget over the next biennium. Uh, 2017 and 2018, we're going to be looking at over a $2 billion budget deficit. We have seen over the last six years the two largest tax increases in state history. Um, and I'm concerned that if we don't check, or rather change, the leadership in this state, that is what we're going to be looking at again, is another very, very large tax increase. And I don't think the people of the state of Connecticut, I don't think the residents of Ansonia or Derby can deal with that. Okay. Mr. Joseph Yauman. Yauman. Uh, did I get it? I got, you got that, it. Right? You nailed it. I want to thank you sincerely for taking the time uh, to come on our podcast. Well, thank you guys very much for having me. It was a pleasure. And if you want to learn more about Mr. Yauman, you can go to yauman2016.com. Or what is your Facebook uh, campaign? I believe it's Yauman2016 as well. Or you, Okay, there you go. Or just put the, uh, his name in uh, your search box there. It's J A U M A. N N. Yes. www.facebook.com backslash Yauman, J-A-U-M-A-N-N, 2016. All right. That's it. Thanks so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you.